Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our fun little Wednesday, What's Cooking with DP. And as you can see, we are in Antarctica today. Um, I'm sitting in my beautiful cabin. I've got my little penguins with me. I've got my little penguin in my hat. And before we start, um, we've got two wonderful guests today who are going to be speaking about Antarctica. We're going to spend some time with Narosha. Morning. How are you? I'm freezing and you. <laughs> freezing as well. I think the weather is very apt for our topic today. So Narosha, so very excitedly, um, I believe that NCL will be starting Antarctica this year. And I know they, they took the jade into Alaska last season, which was, I'm assuming, very successful. So yeah. just some exciting news for us. Can you tell us a little bit about what ships and when? Start yeah, with. sure. So um, they're doing Antarctica from January next year. So we've got two itineraries that we're starting with. Um, it's going to be on the Norwegian um, Star, which has recently been refurbished. It was refurbished at, towards the end of 2018. So the ship is fairly new. It's a decent sized ship as well, taking about 2,300 guests. And yeah, doing Antarctica from Buenos Aires to Buenos Aires, also perfect for airlift. Um, there's a 13-day and a 15-day itinerary. The 13-day one is on the 16th of June to the 29th of June. And that one is calling on the Falkland Islands, Elephant Island, um, Cape Lookout, Deception Island, going right down to the Cape Horn, doing the Shire, Punta Arena, and then back to Buenos Aires with about six cruising days in between. And then it's going straight on to do the next sailing, which is a 15-day sailing. Also, Buenos Aires to Buenos Aires, this one is doing an extra stop in Uruguay and um, where else? And uh, Porto Madryn in Argentina. So, um, very still very stunning itinerary, it's completely new for NCL. Also on the Norwegian star, Buenos Aires to Buenos Aires. So really nice choices. And if, if you were to sort of say from an NCL point of view, why would you recommend NCL to Antarctica? What's so your main selling point? My main selling point is, you know, when passengers or guests sail to Antarctica, they normally sail in the smaller ships, you know, the smaller luxury ships. And, and that's perfect because, I mean, that's the, the type of clientele that normally goes to Antarctica. But then when they get back onto the ship and they're sailing during the night, there's not normally um, entertainment or anything or very low-key entertainment. Whereas if you're on an NCL ship, the ship is still, still has all the full entertainment as a normal, you know, Mediterranean or any other cruise holiday that NCL normally offers. So you'll still have your, your um, evening shows, your comedy shows, your trivias casinos, you know, the full um, experience that you would get on a normal NCL cruise holiday. Only thing is you'll be obviously sailing through Antarctica, which is absolutely brilliant. So you'll get the best of both worlds. And I mean, obviously, I would imagine, you know, NCL being family friendly, would you say that that's also a good option to send families if they want to? Definitely, definitely. That's good. Yeah. And um, costing wise, I mean, how are you sort of finding the costing? Yeah, I've looked at prices. I mean, on the 13-day sailing, just working on the cheapest inside cabin, it's starting from about $1,600 per person, which is absolutely competitive, brilliant pricing. Um, I looked at a balcony, it doesn't go much higher. It's about $2,500. So for a 13-day sailing on a bigger ship, doing this itinerary is brilliant. And then for the 15-day itinerary, not much higher either. I mean, starting from $1,900 and in a balcony, you're looking at about close to about $2,900. So absolutely competitive pricing for this kind of product in Antarctica. Okay. And then just to recap, you said it goes from Buenos Aires to Buenos Aires. So where would you fly in? Do you do a Shwaya? Do you do any of that? Or is it completely different to your other sort of expedition type cruises? Yeah, so they have a full set of excursions. You'll fly in straight into Buenos and out of Buenos, and then there's excursions in every single one of those ports. They are still working on the finer details of the excursions. There are already a few that I can um, pull the list for you, but not everything has been confirmed. But then obviously the, um, I've heard talks, I don't know if it's confirmed as yet, of them looking at pre and post um, packages as well. But it's not yet launched. As soon as that's launched, I'll let you know. But bookings are open as of now. It's now. open already, yes, absolutely. Fantastic. Okay, Narosha, that's really exciting news, and I'm sure all the agents are just gearing to go. And yeah. um, we'll chat to you again next Wednesday. 
110. It's okay, everyone. Thank Be warm, you. stay safe. Okay, bye. Now I'm going to hand over, so I've got two of my colleagues with me today who've both done Antarctica, which is really, really great to have um, sort of a talk from someone who really knows what they're talking about. You know, I can do the selling points, but when you've had someone who's actually been there and experienced it. So I'm going to hand over to Natalia and then Jane will follow on with that. So welcome, Natalia. Lovely to have you with us today. Thanks, Charles. At least I'm in a warmer part of the world than you are. It seems Joburg is very cold today. I'm in Cape Town and it's nice and toasty after having had horrible weather last week. And I'm in Antarctica, silly Billy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the irony is uh, that the weather changes so quickly in Antarctica. You can literally go from sunny, beautiful days uh, at eight o'clock in the morning to at nine o'clock in the morning in a blizzard. Um, so my little virtual backdrop today is a little chinstrap uh, penguin who was following me around uh, an island called Vinca Island for about 200 meters. And they are the most cute little animals. You can see the chinstrap under his chin. Um, there are two other types of penguins as well that you get in Antarctica, the, the Adelie penguin and the Gentoo penguin. Those are, those are the three penguins that you get to see when you go to Antarctica. And after all, that's the reason you go to Antarctica is to spend some time with the penguins. Anyway, so up on your screen, actually, can you just go back uh, for me quickly, please, Roland? Thanks. Up on your screen, you'll see quite a big jigsaw of pack ice. And this, uh, on this particular day, we were woken up very, very early um, on the Hurtigruten ship uh, that I was on, MS Midnight Sol, with the expedition leader, Karen, coming over the airwaves and saying, guys, get up on deck, it must have been about five o'clock in the morning, you're going to see the most amazing thing. And it wasn't even this yet. We, we saw the Kodak Gap, as they call it, the La Mer Channel. And it's very rare that the ships get to navigate that because it's usually filled with icebergs. So we managed to navigate through the Kodak Gap and then we got to this big giant jigsaw puzzle of ice that you see in front of you. And you can see that it is a beautiful, beautiful day and ice for as far as the eye can see with one lone little Adelie penguin on the ice. You can't see him because he was kind of hidden amongst everything. But you'll see that it's very difficult when you are in Antarctica to understand the depth of things because everything is white. So the mountains that you see in the distance there are actually massive, but you have no concept of it because there's no other color for you to actually get a good understanding of how big or how small things are. Next slide, please, Roland. So of course I said it's all about the penguins. There was a lecture on board entitled Antarctica. It's not all about the bloody penguins, but it's definitely all about the penguins. And um, as I said, there are three types that you get to see and depending on when you go, you see different things. So I went very early in the season when they were all reuniting after eight months of being apart and there was lots of um, mating calls and dancing. They dance with each other when they're, when they're mating. Um, and it, depending on where you go, you get the different types of penguins. They are quite ungainly on land. Uh, they're absolutely graceful in the seas. They can swim 30 kilometers an hour when you get them in the sea, but when they're on land, they kind of waddle. And I think the reason why we're so fascinated with penguins is because they very much like human beings in their mannerisms, the way that they kind of waddle this belly that's, that's poking out, um, but they are amazing creatures. And you, when you get onto the ships, they explain to you how to uh, relate to them. And you're not supposed to, to be anywhere within five meters of them. But because they've had, there's been no human interference, they are absolutely fearless. And they'll come right up to you. And there's nothing that you can do about it, unfortunately. They'll follow you around. And they're very attracted to the color red and orange. And you get these parkers when you are on board Hurtigruten, which you get to keep, which are like a blood orange red color. So they are fascinated by you and, and they follow you around. You also told to walk um, in kind of penguin highways. So you're not allowed to stay off the track that the expedition team have put in place. And those penguins then steal the highways um, after you've left because it's easier for them to walk in that area than it is for them to walk on the actual snow. So you'll see a picture here of us. Um, this is the same day as the photograph that you first saw with the beautiful sunshine. And it was literally an hour and a half afterwards. So you can see how it has turned from beautiful sunny day to bl a, a li literally a blizzard. And we were trying to land in Orna Harbor on that day. And Plan C then eventually meant that we landed on 
ice flows in the middle of Paradise Bay. And Paradise Bay is amazing because it's where all the whales frolic. So as we were going from the ship on this tender boat to the ice flows, there were whales breaching all around us, um, actually like right next to, the, next to this little tender boat. And it's really, really intimidating. It looks freezing, but we are quite well wrapped up, as you can see, and on our way through to the flows. Um, because we couldn't land on land on that day, we actually had to land on ice flows. So when you are going with an expedition like a Hurti Groot and they take you on these tender boats and then you are able to land onto, uh, onto non-land, if you will. Very stable, pretty cold once you get there. Uh, next slide. Which one is me? Cheryl, <laughs> the cold one. <laughs> I was very cold, <laughs> but I'll tell you a little bit more later. Over to Jane. Hi everyone. It's Jane from DP. Um, I went to the Antarctica about 10 years ago with um, G Adventures and I would do it again in a heartbeat. Um, it was actually like a dream come true and I would love to know or any of you to share on the chat line where is your best most idyllic dream destination that you've ever traveled to. If you can share that with us it would be interesting to see because this was certainly mine and it was absolutely the most surreal experience. I couldn't for the first three days being in the peninsula I was walking around with my mouth open and just my, I, I couldn't believe that I was actually there. It was just totally unbelievable. Um, the, the icebergs, when you first see the icebergs, some of them are like kilometers long, the ice shelves and the icebergs, they're all different shapes and sizes and they have this bright blue um, colors um, below them, which is absolutely amazing. The scenery is totally dramatic. It's absolutely mind blowing. And the one thing I've never been able to do is if somebody says, what's it really like, um, other than the fact that I'm not very eloquent in my delivery, I just can't describe it. I always just say, go there yourself. So I see um, somebody's put up that they've, their amazing, if their dream place is Great Wall of China or Seychelles. Or, now, if you take those places that you've been to and multiply it by 100, to me, that would be like going to the Antarctic. It was just absolutely mind blowing. Um, today, I'm gonna focus more on the style of travel and the different styles that we have, because I think that's quite important because there are different ships that are suitable to each client based on the products we represent. And that's what goes through a little bit more of the destination. So the, the Antarctic, as Nat said, is home of the penguins and that the colors are orange and red, which is what I have on because I'm trying to attract a penguin. And I think something that's quite important to know, as silly as it sounds, some people have asked whether they can shop in the Antarctic. Some people said they can't wait to go there to see polar bears. And we get so many different questions and it's not, no, it's not a known destination to a lot of people. Of course, you guys will have to know because you're travel agents, you've got to know everything. So. But it, it, it is amazing the, the unknown entities of what comes up and questions that come up. But just to give you a few facts that I'd like to share with you. The time of the year to travel to the Antarctic is October to March. Um, who travels there? I think everybody can travel there. Everybody who enjoys travel, likes adventure um, and wants to experience a once in a lifetime bucket list thing. Visas, South Africans don't need visas. Um, to go to the Antarctic or Argentina. The, um, what to wear, um, what I would suggest you wear are layers. The, this um, jacket that I'm wearing is what I, you get from G Adventures. It's an MS expedition. You get jackets on all the vessels that we represent, but you just wear layers. So you actually start with your costume because you can swim in the Antarctic. Um, they do allow you at one of the um, deception islands in a volcanic um, island, you just go in your costume and run in and it's really quite an experience. And then you put on t-shirts, jeans, which you wear most of the time on the ship, jackets, and then another parka, and then headgear, um, masks, which we're all very accustomed to now. 
but of the warmer type, and then sunglasses for ice and extreme um, conditions. So the most popular itinerary that we sell from the South African are the 11 to 13 day classic trips. And that generally is two days across the Drake Passage from Ushuaia uh, into the Antarctic, four to five days in the peninsula at different islands, and then two days back across the Drake Passage. I think one of the things that a, a question that comes up often or questions are fear factors. So the one is the cold weather. And I can show you for those people in Joburg, the last few days have been a lot colder here than it was in my entire time on the Antarctic. And because you spend a lot of time on the ship, you just literally wear jeans and t-shirt, tackies and a cardigan and that's it. And you don't, it's one of the few places in the world you never have to wake up in the morning and think, what am I going to wear today? Because you just, it doesn't matter what you wear, as long as you're warm and, you, and you're relaxed and you're comfortable, that's all that matters on all the different ships that we represent. And the Drake Passage crossing is two days each way. People are quite nervous of that because it is known either as the Drake or the Lake Passage. So it's either very hectic or very flat. Um, on my particular trip coming back, at, I don't know if any of you have done the Zambezi um, river rafting and gone through that washing machine. So when I was coming back, I went through what the whole night it was like being in the washing machine in the Zambezi. But I was fine because I was in the, ca in the cabin with the captain, so I was okay, I felt quite secure. That was a joke. Um, I wish I had been, but <laughs> I was sitting on the edge of my bed. But I think the ship that I went on at that time had no stabilizers, and it was one of the older ships. And today, all of the ships that go into the Antarctic are equipped to um, be in touch with icebergs, and they also all have stabilizers. So it's very easy. And I know a lot of people have been that both ways across the sailing of the Drake Passage have been like a lake, that they're just going on a med cruise. So it, it's, it's, un, it's unpredictable, you don't know. Just to go through the three different styles of travel we have, um, I wanna to touch on G-Adventures. The, the G-Adventures has the MS Expedition, which is the one that I went on to. Um, it's a smaller ship. Roland, oh, there, there's a ship, sorry. So it carries 134 passengers. And I think something else which is important to know on the Antarctic, you cannot have more than 100 people on any landing at any given time. So the bigger sh the ship, the less likely or the less time you may spend on um, land. But I think when we get to the bigger ships, Nats can ex explain what you can do on board because there's so much to do. Um, the, the, sh the MS expedition is suitable for single people, younger people, couples and elderly. A lot of people, I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who the husband wants to go and the wife doesn't. So on the MS expedition, it's quite important to know that you can, they've got cabins for four people, a quad cabin sharing, and you don't spend any time in your cabin, literally just when you sleep. So if you've got someone who wants to go on their own, they can just share with three other males if it's a male person, and you literally, it's just a place to camp down. Um, they also have very qualified expedition lectures where, while you're traveling across the Drake Passage as well as the whole time in the Antarctic. And I think the, the G Adventure ship is a very laid back and relaxed environment. They also allow entry into the bridge to assist the captain in sightseeing. And you can watch him navigate all the icebergs and look out for whales and other, um, other mammals that are there. And then a, new, a unique feature on the MS Expedition, they have a mudroom which is where you get on and off the zodiacs for all the landings. And you can, when you come off, you can keep your boots there and you can hang your jackets up and they stay there until, until you go on the next landing. So it, they dry and you don't have to lug them back and forth to your cabin. So that's something that I really liked about the um, MS Expedition. Just going on to um, Penant, um, they, they have four ships in the Antarctic. They all start with La or La. So I won't mention them each, but they have itineraries ranging from 11 to 17 days. And all the ships, although they take 264 passengers, in the Antarctic, they will only take a maximum of 200. And again, that is because of the landing. So that you can have, you'd only have two landings per island, which make it easier to facilitate. 
Um, those ships are on the Penant, both Nat and I have been on a Penant ship, in fact we went together, and it's a more sophisticated, cruisy style um, ship than the others, and I would suggest they more suitable for couples who are seeking adventure, culture with a touch of com comfort and sophistication. But again, all trips into the Antarctic are relaxed and informal. They also have highly qualified expedition lead, um, leaders and they also have an association with National Geographic. So many of their cruises and their trips have got, um, they've got specialized people giving lectures on board, which adds a nice touch to it. And they also allow passengers into the bridge. And then cabins are more luxurious on, um, on Penang compared to obviously the MS Expedition. So there's more variety. And the pricing, I just want to mention the pricing on all the ships now because G Adventures start between 100,000, but that's sharing a cabin with four and go to 170,000. Penant are about 148,000. So it doesn't matter what ship you go on, the pricing seems to be pretty much the same across the board. Um, on Hurti, the pricing on Hurti in a double cabin starts at 132,000 rand per person. So it's all very comparable. I'm just going to touch on Hurti before Nats goes because she's been on Hurti route and so she'll go in more detail and the experiences, but I just want to mention the ships that they have. They've also got four ships now in the Antarctic. Some have been built, have only been launched now in 2020, some in 2019, and that's the first ever hybrid ships with state-of-the-art stabilizers as well. And the oldest of them is the MS Fram, which is, it's, it only takes 200 passengers to the Antarctic. And then the other newest ships are the Midnight Soul, the Amundsen and the Nansen, Fridge of Nansen, and they will not take more than 500 passengers into the Antarctic. So I think um, based on first-hand experience of Hurti and the Antarctic and what to expect from your trip and some of the amazing shore excursions that we do, um, I'll hand back over to Nat and I just have to say that it is, if anyone ever wants to do something mind-blowing, I would highly recommend it. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. It is mind blowing. And you know, the challenge I came back, I had to write, I think, 10 stories about my experience and convey how amazing it was as an experience. And, and I share Jane's sentiment, how difficult it is to explain to someone because you've actually really got to be there. Sorry, my dogs are very excited. They're not penguins. I promise. I promise. Um, okay, so on the ship itself, like uh, Jane mentioned a little bit earlier, there are lectures on board and those lectures range from everything from um, lichen and how lichen grows. I've never been so fascinated about lichen. I trust you. I, I, I promise you it was very, very interesting to listen to. To the discoverers, you know, the Ernest Shackletons and the Ralt Amundsens, the guys who came at the turn of the 20th century and discovered this last wilderness that no one um, had ever been to. And what they saw then is what you see now. Nothing has changed because nobody owns Antarctica, um, which is why it's, it's so brilliant to go because Antarctica needs ambassadors so that it can remain the way that it has forever, for millennia. Uh, and on board, you learn about the history of Antarctica. You learn about the geography, that, that it's the world's highest and driest, would you believe, continent. Um, but you also get to participate in citizen science projects. So as you leave Ushuaia, you get enrolled to count um, different bird species, for example, or whales. You can take photograph, uh, photographs of whale tails and each whale tail is unique. So you actually help to document all the whales that are swimming in the Southern Ocean. So you get to participate in, in, in those types of activities as well. And of course, it is very comfortable on board um, Hurti Gruten. You, we had passengers who were eight years old to passengers who were 80 years old. So it was a very widespread, also quite laid back, um, phenomenal food, all Norwegian inspired, of course, great hospitality. And then when you actually land, the expedition team is, is amazing. They set everything up from putting the flags out where you're allowed to walk, to carving ice steps for you. You can see we're all trying to keep our five meter distance away from those penguins. Unfortunately, we don't always have a choice. They come running to us, but you can see that red um, parka that you get to keep and everybody's wearing their boots. So the boots get given to you on board. And as you come back uh, 
off uh, onto the onto the ship, you actually have to um, sanitize them so that you don't take anything on land and off land that could contaminate other parts of Antarctica. Um, that's also a beautiful day. They seem to take photographs when it's beautiful and sunny outside, but we sometimes we would land and within an hour, because you have you can only be on land for an hour, the weather would turn to blizzard. And the way of seeing that there was a blizzard coming was to watch the penguins. And when the penguins start sliding on their bellies towards the water, you know that you need to get off land, even though it's sunny, because they know that a blizzard's coming. Uh, next slide, please, Roland. Right, so this was an amazing opportunity. It was one of the excursions that they offer for a very select few. I won a lottery to be one of 30 people who spent the night on Antarctica. And you can see our red tents there. Um, this was probably about midnight. Um, the sun doesn't set at that uh, time of year. And we stayed, we camped on land um, overnight with a glacier carving across the bay and walking up to the rookery to see the penguins at our heart's content. And it was the most amazing and the coldest experience. And you're not allowed to take any food or drink with you. So um, we, didn't, we didn't spend longer than we actually absolutely had to spend on land. Next slide, please. Also a really cool thing to do, other than the landing, which you, you, you would do normally a um, uh, hundred people on land at a time, or the camping, which is a little, which is quite expensive. And as I say, very, very select few. They don't get to do the camping each trip because it depends on the weather and you need really good weather to camp, is the kayaking. And I would absolutely recommend going on a kayak trip. It's about two hours. You kayak in and amongst all the glaciers and the icebergs. We get, you get right up close to um, all of that ice and it is an incredible experience. You'll see you have to suit up quite significantly. There are three layers under that blue suit uh, that you can't see just in case you fall out and you have to be fished out. But there are always two people with you at every time from the expedition team and they lead it. So you are in absolutely good hands. Next slide, please. Right, so you'll see this, um, she's actually a very well-known uh, journalist in the UK. She's taking a photograph of two, photograph of two Gen 2s and you'll see there the red flags that are there. That outlines where you're allowed to walk. But a real tip from me would be to put your camera down. You know, you get lost in taking photographs and then you don't actually sit and listen to the penguins and watch them. Um, they are very, they're oblivious to you. I mean, they are completely fearless. So you can see exactly what they would do, whether or not you were there. So um, we spent a lot of time just sitting and watching them. Um, and you'll see in the background there, again, the depth perception in Antarctica is such that you don't understand the distance, but she's probably not standing more than two meters away from them. They've come close to her. And in the distance, you can see all the little ice flows and then the ship and how beautiful and calm that water is. It's, it's absolutely astounding. It's, you just, it's indescribable. Next slide, please. Um, you can also go on excursions. So you can take a photography course. Um, so we've got two people there who are on a photography course, or you can go out as part of the citizen science projects and go and collect uh, specimens. So you might need to go out and collect lichen specimens or specimens of krill, which is what the penguins actually feed on. And the krill um, is quite an important thing to be monitoring because without krill, penguins don't survive and other species don't survive. And without those species, whales don't survive. So krill is actually a um, keystone species and the levels of krill in the Antarctic are very important for the entire world, not just for the Antarctic. So these two are out on a photography expedition and there are photographers on board who teach you how to take photographs. Um, but as I said, it's not all about taking photographs. You also just need to soak up this amazing atmosphere um, without a camera in front of you. There you can see the blizzard has hit. So now we are, cl we are climbing up a hill to get to the top. You'll see in the distance is a rookery of chin straps. And these chin straps live up in the stones. And, and what's so amazing about the chin, strap is, chin straps is that they nest on stones. So you will watch them pick up a stone and put the stone down for their nest and another penguin stealing the stone when the, when the penguin has gone to get another stone. So thievery is alive and well in Antarctica and they steal each other's stones for their nests. And that's why they nest all the way up in those stone rookeries at the top 
so they couldn't get down to the water to avoid the blizzard. But what they do is they huddle together, packed tight like that pack ice that you saw earlier, to keep warm. And they get, they get pelted by ice and by snow, but they just keep in a little warm bundle. Um, it's actually quite cute to watch. Next slide, please. Uh, I should just mention that uh, those poles that you saw in the previous photograph, you get those poles, they give you the poles, the expedition poles. The boots you get as well, the parka you get. So really all you need is to make sure that you have a waterproof backpack. It's, it's important to have a backpack and not another bag because you've got to swivel out of the tender boat and having something that keeps your hands free is very important. And then having a waterproof layer because as you can see, um, the weather changes really, really, really quickly in Antarctica and you don't want to be caught on land even though you're only there for an hour when you um, haven't got a waterproof layer and a wind windproof layer as well. So you can see the tiny size of the ten, uh, tender boat there in comparison with one of the small ice flows. And the color of that blue that you see there is actually called beryl blue. And it's, it, is a, uh, it is a thing of nature. It's just the way that the, the light ref the, uh, refracts through the ice. Um, the, it's so densely packed that that is the color that comes out. So it's not actually blue, it's just blue because of the way that the light hits the ice and it's called beryl blue. So you can go on these little, uh, sometimes if you can't land, they'll take you out on these tender boats and you'll just go um, put putting around and, and having a look at the scenery. Next slide, please. Oh, that's it. Okay. Do you want me to go into some of the nuggets um, of knowledge shells? Uh, I've got quite a few from my, my little trip. Yes, please, Nat. That would be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so always try and attend every single lecture if you can, because it gives you great context um, about what you are going to see. Even something like lichen. If you see it on a piece of paper and you think, oh goodness, I'm going to go to a lichen lecture. It's so interesting listening to what they tell you and then to be able to see that on land. So take full advantage of that, um, of those le lectures on board, because on board you have ornithologists, you have biologists, mm -hmm. You have um, all sorts of scientists that have lots of knowledge um, that they share with you. So it's really important to go to those. Uh, buy a map so that you can track your journey and see where it is that you're going. That's really important. Um, make sure that you've got comfortable shoes on board. Don't think you need to buy ski boots, for example, uh, to go to Antarctica because you get the, bo the boots when you are on board. They, sh they give you the boots for your landing. You're not allowed to use other boots, so there's no point in you buying expensive ski boots. Just take very comfortable shoes. Suntan lotion and lip balm, absolutely essential. Um, seasickness, better to buy the seasickness tablets that they sell on board. The ones we get here in South Africa just are not effective enough for the Drake Shake, which I experienced both ways. And my other little secret tip for the Drake Shake is sour green apples somehow that settles your stomach and they have loads of them on board to and from thankfully so that's always a good thing to have and my last uh, thing is that you should recommend to your clients that they either read or watch the movie South which is the story of Ernest Shackleton and his voyage to Antarctica and how he, he got stranded in pack ice and had to make his way I think it was something like 800 miles across the ice over three years to, to get free. But it gives you such a good perspective of this wilderness that we shouldn't be able to visit and yet we have an opportunity to do so and that we have to because Antarctica needs ambassadors to come back and tell people to be more careful about what they do to the environment because that is where you see it the most is in Antarctica. I cannot, there is no price you can pay for this experience. It is priceless. And I would be so happy to speak to anyone who, who you are trying to persuade, someone you know has a lust, a wanderlust, and is an adventurous soul who wants to go to Antarctica. If you need any advice, you want anybody to speak to them, I promise you I'm very happy to do that. I'm also very happy to share any of my photographs and the stories that I wrote. And the movie is South and the book is South, okay, by Ernest Shackleton. That's me, thanks Charles. Thanks Natalia, and thanks Jane. I think that was some, one of the most inspiring um, take on Antarctica for all of us. I mean, we're all just rearing to go. As you can see, I've, Lisa, I've got a very well-trained penguin. Um, I don't know about those penguins in Antarctica. And then before we finish, I normally do a little cooking something for you, but today I'm not, because as you can see, I'm sitting in my cabin in Antarctica. 
So I'm just going to carry on being a frolicking whale and carry on with marshmallows and hot chocolate while we hand over to a beautiful video, mm, delicious, beautiful video of Antarctica. So thank you for joining us, guys, and we'll see you again next week.